are the Pinewood Studios in Buckinghamshire, famous, of course, for their links with James Bond. The place is awash with discarded Bond toys, and it's in this massive soundstage that he saved the world from certain destruction more times than... Well, more times than Stella Remington, that's for sure. But the new Bond film, GoldenEye, which is due to go into production next year, isn't being filmed at Pinewood. The man himself is new too, Pierce Brosnan. So, does this mean there'll be a new Bond car? Ever since the early Connery days of Goldfinger and Thunderball, 007 and Aston Martin have been as entwined as Gilbert and Sullivan, only rather more palatable. He may have had the odd Audi and Lotus, but these are the memories we'll always have when we think of 007's wheels. This was the car Bond used in the living daylights, with its huge V8 engine, those skis, the laser tyre shredders, the added performance bonus of rocket propulsion, and a brace of guided missiles up front. It made mincemeat of the Czech police force's larders. The trouble is that the modern-day equivalent of this car costs £180,000, and that's before you start adding any toys. Now, M simply can't justify that kind of outlay these days, especially when the only time he encounters the Russians is when he pops down to the embassy for tea and buns. So, what's Bond gonna get then? A proton? I rather think not. is the Aston Martin DB7, perhaps the most beautiful car Britain has ever made. As a result, it's the seemingly obvious choice for any triangular torsoed secret service Johnny. And the Treasury won't mind either, because it costs only £80,000. And I do mean only, because £80,000 is what you pay these days for humdrum cars like BMWs, Mercedes. £80,000 for an Aston Martin is cheap. Tiffany Dell could afford three. Except Tiffany Dell doesn't like the DB7. Has the man gone mad? He says it's too soft, too cosseting, and that round a track a Porsche 928 would make mincemeat of it. Round a track, maybe, but on ordinary roads, the DB7 makes the 928 look like a skateboard. It glides over bumps that would shatter Porsche man's spine. And yet, despite this, I'm not talking here about a sponge. Indeed, this car holds the road like it's been nailed there. Even when the roads are more like rivers, it is still a dream. I'm talking about the sort of dream where you're James Bond, where you learn you can fly, where you're married to Michelle Pfeiffer, and where your doctor says you have to live on a diet of nothing but lobster thermidor, and that the NHS will pay. Certainly. I bet James Bond wishes he'd had a DB7 when he was being chased around Pinewood by Goldfinger's bouncers. Speeded up sequences hide the fact that the DB5 handled like a canal boat. Let's not forget that even Bond, a man who can wrestle sharks, lost control and cost the taxpayer 25 grand. Ah. This coming up here was the actual wall that he hit in Goldfinger. If he'd have had one of these, he would have made it back home with Tilly Masterson, and then there'd have been something a lot more exciting going on in his trousers. A Goldfinger's laser beam. So, what we're talking about here is a refined, comfortable, grown-up car. And that's in keeping with the interior, which is a far cry from the Habitat meets McLaren nonsense that Tiff seems to like. The wood and leather is just fantastic, but I would have expected more toys. CD player's an option, and you can't get a tape out without changing out of fifth. 
There's no sunshine roof, there's no ejector seat, and there's no airbags. James Bond may be licensed to kill, but the DB7 is not. Q may have some work to do on the inside then, but he can leave the engine well alone, because it's a gem. The block is basically a 3.2-litre Jaguar unit. Remember, this car was originally conceived as a replacement for the XJS. Remember, too, that both companies are now owned by Ford. The background, then, is clear enough, but the foreground can get awfully blurred. That's because the supercharger Aston fits to the six-cylinder motor results in 335 brake horsepower. In a turbocharged car, you have to wait until the blower girds its loins and starts to strut its stuff. But with a supercharger, the power is always right there, right when you need it. As always, I'd prefer a V8, but this is the next best thing. It's helped along by a lightweight body too, so that here we have a car which gets from 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds. A car which can hit 160 miles an hour. Impressed? Well... To be honest, Tiff wasn't. He pointed out that the 928 and the Ferrari 355 are faster and that they handle better. But as usual, dear old thing, he's missing the point. You see, with the Aston, in the back you get a couple of seats which are vaguely usable. Round here you have a boot which can handle rather more than a bag of sugar. And it has the sort of restrained good looks that the Germans, the Italians and the Japanese just don't understand. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the Porsche 928. The Ferrari 355 is the best car I've ever driven, but this is just so elegant. Now, it might be outgunned, but would you just look at this? That was built by a man, not R2-D2. It's also worth mentioning the brakes on this car because they'll haul it from 70 miles an hour to a standstill in exactly half the distance quoted in the highway code. So don't follow me too closely. Despite its ability to stop like it's hit a wall, this is no technological tour de force. It's more a tour de south coast with a tartan rug over its knee. There's no adaptive damping, no traction control, no gold lining for the engine bay. This is not a Game Boy. It's not Nouvelle Cuisine. It's good, wholesome and traditional, like meat pie and two veg, neither of which are lentils. I'd rather have a Ferrari 355 that you cost about the same. But when I'm old and wizened and my nose is bent and grey, I may well go knocking on Aston Martin's door and asking, are you building them properly yet? I know of two DB7s which, while being tested by colleagues on the magazines, have suffered from, let's be polite, let's say difficulties. And on this one, this window doesn't shut properly, the headlamps keep steaming up, there's a funny whirring noise in fifth gear, and so many pieces of trim have fallen off, I could hold a car boot sale. Using a car like this every day is rather like putting the most exquisite crockery you have in the dishwasher. It will break. And here's the deal. A Porsche 928 is mass-produced. It's reliable. So is the Ferrari 355. So is the BMW 850i. A Mercedes-Benz S-Class is invincible. Now, people are going to want and expect total reliability from their DB7. And I've just got the most horrible, horrible feeling they're going to be disappointed. If I'm wrong, and believe me, I hope I am, and if you're over 50, then you will not find a better car than the DB7. James Bond should have the vantage, but his dad, Mr Albert Bond of Acacia Avenue, Hazelmere, should have one of these.